All right, so here we go with the King in Black big spill. But before we get started, first I wanna mention, we got like eight videos put together for this one, and the audio for the first one is not the best because late last year I had to go out of town for a family emergency, and I attempted to clean up the audio for part one just for the big spill, but it didn't help much. But after part one, we're back to normal. But I also wanna mention within this big spill, on top of us talking about King and Black, just issues one through five, the main story, I'm also talking about a bit of the other tie-ins like the Union and Atlantis attacks, as well as Venom 32 through 34. And then to end it all, I just do our talks about Venom 200 at the end. Cause I noticed there are a lot of things that just hit different when you just sit through the whole thing straight. But with that being said, let's get into it. And here we go. Hey guys, welcome back. So now with getting into the King in Black, first and foremost, I do want to say, please excuse the audio for this video. Um, away from my usual setup, so we're kind of just making it work. But with that being said, Nell has arrived and he is quickly letting people know and he ain't nothing to play with. So let's get into it. But first, if you're new to the channel, be sure to subscribe to catch the spells every week. And don't forget to hit that bell up top so you can squat up in the comments for the first hour. All right, so with the way that we jump into King and Black part one, Eddie and Dylan had just made their way back into the main Marvel universe after the conclusion of Venom Beyond. But also at this point, it puts us pretty close to the events that had taken place in Web of Venom Empire's End. Back when we got a glimpse into the process of Null blacking out the universe, which could have been a mini series within itself, low key. But we pick up here where both of those stories meet and all the alerts are going out to the Avengers who had been informed and been making preparations since the conclusion of Venom Island. Back when Eddie gave all the Avengers the full rundown of who Noel is and everything that Eddie knew as far as tips on how to combat Noel and hopefully defeat him. But it's also at this time after Eddie's called Cap and told the heroes to move into their positions when Eddie then goes to get Dylan, who at this time, Dylan also senses himself that Noel is close. But then it's right after this when we then jump over to Avengers Mountain, where we see that Tony's using leftover ships from the Kree Skrull Armada, which he's pretty much rigged to explode as soon as a wave of Noel's dragons comes close enough within striking distance. But I do gotta say, like, I'm not really sure that there's something about this plan specifically, but anytime that I see Tony hacking anything scroll related, which post Empire is now Kree or Skrull in the same. But for whatever reason, recently when Tony's had these kind of moments in relation to anything Skrull technology, I kind of feel like he just still wants to stick it to the Skrulls just after Secret Invasion. And I don't know, I could be looking into it too deep, but I just felt like there's been moments recently where his smirk's just a little bit bigger than usual. But in this case, when he's given the green light to blow up these ships and take out these Grendels, Eddie, on the other hand, he's able to tell like the scale of the effect with, of what Tony did. And he lets Tony know like, okay, well you took out about like a hundred of them, which is barely scratching the surface in comparison to the waves of these dragons still falling in. And as these symbiotes make their way and actually touch down to the ground or make contact with the buildings, they then begin to spread and merge, covering a large area super quick. But then it's also here where Eddie takes Dylan to a secret bunker that was built by Ezekiel, which originally had the purpose to protect spider totems from inheritors, which isn't a light task by any means because inheritors were just super strong. And I got a link below that'll catch you up on all that. Like those guys were serious. But with Eddie taking Dylan to this bunker for his protection, Dylan begs for Eddie to let him out there and let him help because we got a glimpse of what Dylan's capable of in Venom Beyond. And on top of that, Dylan even suggests that he could take control of part of Noel's army and not even like in a ridiculous way, but just in a way enough to contribute somehow. But very understandably so, like Eddie is like, no, that, that's not gonna happen. Because even with everything that we know about Noel, like nobody really knows the truest depths of his power. So like with that being said, like why would Eddie put his own son up against that with only the assurance of hoping for the best. And I mean, like as the reader, we would want Dylan to go out there, but you know, with Eddie being his father, it makes sense that he's not gonna let that happen. Not to forget that Eddie's also mentioned in the past that part of the reason that he goes so hard at times trying to protect Dylan, like a lot of it really comes from a place where Eddie feels like he's let Dylan down prior to this point. And with that being the case, like an argument could be made that Eddie's not thinking straight with just trying to hide Dylan. So it could really go either way here. But nonetheless, at this point, it's go time, so there's not a lot of room for improvisation at this point. But then it's here where we also get a look at Plan B, which then has Captain America on the ground, but at this point also heavily focused on heroes who either have access to some type of electrical power, and then aside from that, cosmic 
and after that magic but all in all really just trying to prioritize what they know will be effective against symbiotes and kind of gauging the maneuvers of the ground team from there and so while captain america is leading the heroes and handling the first wave on the ground he more or less gets the comms like avengers endgame on your left and it's via telepathy not so much over the radio but in this case when it happens cap gets like this please excuse me for intruding your minds and when we see who it is it's charles xavier lending the help with the x-men and this is a huge help because prior to this point they had been waiting for thor whose calls have all been going straight to voicemail and he's not answering his email. So fortunately enough, with the X-Men showing up here, they at least have the support with the thunder and lightning coming from Storm, which we've seen through Eddie as like one of the most effective defenses against symbiotes recently. So it's good that Storm's at least there for the second wave. But then it's here where Eddie goes into his preparations for his plans for the third wave, to where in this case he plans to use the Spire from Absolute Carnage, to where prior to this point the plan was for him to tap into the minds of the symbiotes that have been struck down either by Storm or by Thor. But from the looks of it at this point, it seems like Storm either needs more concentration, either to form the lightning or to form the lightning and aim. But even still, regardless of who is playing that role, it's still a shot in the dark for Eddie to try to pull this together or make it work out. Because even still, at any point in time, Noel could just reach through the Venom symbiote and just choke Eddie out or reach through the spire itself and just ball that whole thing up which then also wouldn't be the ideal situation. But even still, Eddie has to try because the only other option would be using Dylan. And in the case of Eddie, he's not even trying to entertain that idea. But then it's here where Eddie connects to the Spire. The first thing he sees is just heavy hitters left and right being overwhelmed. Doctor Strange, with too many symbiotes pushing him back. Storm, practically in the same situation, throwing lightning in every direction, but instead she's getting closed in on fast. And during this time, Eddie, who's going back and forth on the cons with Tony, at this point he's like it's not just the dragons it's not just no it's the celestials and like i just imagine at this point in time that no no needs some respect put on his name because like if he was overhearing this he'd be like what you mean not just no it's the celestials because clearly no beat the celestials so it's like where does he stand now because with just seeing the celestials here it's clear that no defeated the celestials but for some reason to everyone here observing the symbiote celestial is the wow factor rather than the person who made this happen. Because in my opinion, it's a bigger testament that No faced the celestials before he had a Grendel, before he made the necro sword, and he didn't die. <laughs> and I mean, after that, you can insert No severed the head of a celestial created nowhere, but at no point should you fear the product more than the person who produced it. But it's here where Null arrives and he sees all the heroes lined up and he more or less tells them like, okay, yeah, I'm here to kill your world and I'm looking for this guy named Brock as well. And I'm not really doing the two in any specific order, but if you hand over Brock, I'll make sure that the end of the world just goes as quickly as possible. But then it's also here where Cap gets his call for his big gun to come in. And that big gun, of course, is a sentry. And really like during that time, just the anticipation of waiting on that big gun. Like to me in my mind, it was like, okay, it was either gonna be the sentry or like Blue Marvel or somebody. But with it being the century and this being like your part one or your beginning of the King in Black, I feel like a lot of people just kind of knew what was coming next, especially with the duality of Bob Reynolds and the Void and putting that up against the King of the Abyss, like this wasn't going to go well. And I feel like every reader had that feeling as soon as they turned the page and they saw the century. But what's even crazier is that no, he tells the century that he knows of him through the information that he's gained through the symbiotes. So with that being done, it's like step one knows like, okay, I know who you are. But the sheer disrespect comes in when No uses the Sentry's signature move on the Sentry and just tears him in half, separating him from the Void with like your split explosion Sentry move. Like that's the Sentry's signature move. Like No just pulled the move of the Sentry, pun intended. And it's crazy seeing it take place, but I'm really glad that Donny Cates took the time to tie the Sentry and the Void and tie that to No very quick. Because I feel like a lot of people were expecting that, but it's, it's a whole nother thing seeing it, man. But when this happens, this pretty much marks just the beginning of the end. No has literally got the world flooded with symbiotes and all he does is just lift his hand and just like that, everyone who's on the ground team, they're covered in symbiotes. And from there, Noel just closes his hand and the rest of the world is then blanketed by symbiotes, just like we had seen in Empire's End. And when this happens, like it's pretty crazy how we see Storm, who's like the last one standing here. 
especially with us knowing of like her conditions with being claustrophobic and it's like she's reaching out to Tony for a plan like what's the next move or even Charles like someone come up with something and even though Tony is communicating that he's trying to figure out something it's still crazy watching Storm go down like after giving everything she's had to like the last moment and even when this happens like understandably so like Charles is pissed and for good reason because the X-Men they have been going through a lot as far as making sure mutants don't go extinct so by all means this isn't helping but that is here where Eddie gets kind of fed up and he tells Xavier and Tony that he has a plan and with doing so he just tosses his earpiece and you know good and well when somebody says they got a plan and they toss the earpiece it's cause they don't want nobody like to rebuttal or to argue with that plan and really like when that happens they're better off saying well I'm about to do something here it go because for Eddie his plan is just to give Noel what he wants and hopefully just end it there so Eddie reaches out to Noel giving up the location and the symbiote just kind of gives Eddie this moment of okay this is it like this is the end of the line <laughs> and I just want you to know that I love you man and I'm, I'm so glad Eddie that Eddie never treat me like animal <laughs> and I'm just playing like the symbiote ain't say none of that but you can tell that he really wanted to open up in this moment and if for no other reason than really just to tell Eddie thank you because really even with like the all the recent retroactive storytelling concerning the symbiote whether in Venom First Host or Symbiote Spider-Man like Eddie and the symbiote they've been through the most and after Eddie I'd say like Flash but either way I'm sure there's no argument that Peter Parker is like the least connected to the symbiote like they, they would never have this kind of moment and like I, for some reason it's kind of making me think of it on a deeper level like Peter just got rid of the symbiote like he didn't really give it a chance to be better but at the same time that dysfunction with Peter it led to everything throughout the symbiosis and the relationship up until now <laughs> but either way but with no seeing this beacon and finding where Eddie is and snatching him up like right away Eddie's like look just get it over with you got me but then it's here where Noel recognizes Eddie from the first encounter with the Grendel and Eddie's first time teaming up with Miles Morales and really first time Time meeting Miles for that matter but it's here where we quickly find out that Eddie he is not the Brock that Noel is looking for and after telling this to Eddie he just rips off the Venom symbiote and tosses him down to the city and although for the most part this is like all new information for Eddie like we already knew that Noel had his eyes set on Dylan like from the good son to Dylan's dreams Venom Island like Dylan has been leaving Noel's messages on red for a minute and really man I feel like if Dylan and Eddie had that father son talk like if Dylan opened up earlier and told Eddie more like a lot could have been avoided and vice versa too like if Eddie could have told Dylan more like a lot of things could have just been avoided because at the end of the day either one of them they're gonna find out through somebody else at some point much like Eddie did here all right so jumping into part two I'm gonna be pulling some stuff from like all over the place just to paint a bit of a picture of what's happening in relation to some of the tie-ins because where we had last left off with Null stripping the Venom symbiote off of Eddie Brock we also have the case to where the effects of this invasion leaving their mark all across the world and this we knew mainly from what we had seen in part one with no symbiotes covering the entire planet and it's in that case with some of the tie-ins to where we take a bit of a closer look on how some of that chaos unfolded in different areas around the world to where you might have guessed it didn't go too well for anybody else either and part of that we see in the union issue one which takes place in great britain and in their case it started off with this live broadcast of how they're putting this new team together but then it quickly went left when a symbiote dragon just swooped through and started tearing these people apart and i mean like okay well let me tone that back like every Everybody didn't get torn apart because when the dragon showed up Britannia she did leap into action before anyone else charging for the dragon and taking its head clean off which we know is not going to finish that thing but with doing so she was also impaled in the process which sucked because right after that the remains then went on to a couple of soldiers who already didn't like this new team because aside from Union Jack they're already making fun of a lot of the new members and saying how those guys weren't necessarily British hero material but then aside from this you also have a bit of what's been going on with Atlantis attacks because over there you have Mike Wen who had constructed the city of Pan which in itself is like a city that is made of slices of other cities like Tokyo, Hong Kong, Magic poor and many others but to power this city he had stole a dragon from Atlantis which didn't play out well when Namor came back asking for it but after that whole thing had played out Mike Wen had then taken interest in symbiote dragons which is now taking him into another direction moving forward and it's pretty interesting because it kind of leans into the Shang-Chi history to where thousands of years ago dragons were like these wise advisors and the humans were more like their avatars and with them referencing it now I kind of want to see how they tie it with symbiotes 
But that just gives us a bit of a glimpse at what's been going on around the world during the time of the chaos of King and Black issue 1. But then after this, then jumping over to Venom issue 31, which I almost feel like it could have been the same issue as King and Black part 2, mainly because the way that the two read so seamlessly, but instead it's delivered as a tie-in. And when I read it, I was like, I'm definitely going to put that in part 2 in the same video. But even still, I think it was pretty sick how the title was called 32 seconds, with everything that took place within that issue happening within that short window of time. Because it's here when we see when Null had stripped Eddie from the Venom symbiote and tossed him off the building, where he absorbs the symbiote into himself, to where we get that painful departure between Eddie and the Venom symbiote. But I also feel like it's quite a bit going on here, with the 32 second theme having a number of things happening at the same time. Because not long after when we jump over to Dylan, we see a bit of that. Because in the case of Dylan, who like we had seen was locked away in Ezekiel's safe room, which at this point still has like a day one PS4 sitting over in the corner. Which kind of shows the age of this room a little bit. But while he's here, he gets his hands on a radio and he tries to see like what's going on out there. And mainly because the TV that he's watching, like the signals lagging, the pictures going out. And for that reason, he's trying to make verbal contact with someone to see what's going on. And he gets Tony Stark for a second, but he just dismisses Dylan with the quickness by more or less telling Dylan let the grown people handle this and to get off the radio and keep the line free. But with Dylan being locked down here and having the television going in and out, it really just leaves Dylan to find some other type of method to reach out and either get in contact with Eddie or just find out what's going on. And so the next thing he does, he uses his powers to reach out to Eddie and the Venom symbiote. And when he does, a couple things happen here at the same time. Because one, the symbiote tells him to hurry up and disconnect and it pushes him out because this is happening at the very moment that Null is stripping the symbiote off of Eddie. And as soon as Dylan is pushed out by the Venom symbiote, the television has a moment of clarity to where he actually sees the moment on the news when the two were separated and Eddie was dropped from the rooftop. And it really makes you think like, man, there's got to be a few things running through Dylan's mind. And it could be like, one, this cameraman was fire. Because to catch an angle like that in the middle of all this chaos, <laughs> like you showing some talent right now. But then secondly, I imagine he's thinking of Tony Stark and just thinking like, man, that guy's such a liar. <laughs> talking about they got this. Because from that image alone, Dylan can tell that things aren't looking good for his dad, let alone anyone else. But aside from Dylan seeing that brief clip of what's going on, after Eddie was dropped, there was a moment where he had said like this quick prayer, because in this moment he's dropping, he ain't got no symbiote, so in his mind he's like it's a wrap, dear god. But in this moment it's very unselfish where Eddie just says a prayer for Dylan, that he turns out to be safe, and that he doesn't eventually pay for the sins of his father. But also like with first seeing this happen, like I have one of these moments to where like, you know like when your logical brain tries to figure out stuff in the comic book? But yeah, like that's what happened and I had one of these moments like right here. Because as Eddie is falling and he sees this chopper like trying to get away from one of these symbiote dragons, and I'm thinking initially like is that military or is that the chopper with the cameraman who deserves an award? But either way, when Eddie sees the chopper he tells them to land because they're not gonna outfly that dragon. And Eddie was right because a dragon clipped the chopper which then immediately caused it to explode. But this is the part when logical brains started thinking a little bit like okay so like when the chopper exploded it kind of looked like the explosion slowed down Eddie's fall or at least that's what I picked up as the story that's being given with him being knocked off of his trajectory into an alley to where he physically did an integrity check on every fire escape on the way down hitting all kind of rails and breaking bones left and right. Like this in itself was just painful to watch only for him to land on top of this car to where it's like dude your skeletal integrity has to be like the equivalent to like cereal crumbs right now <laughs> like he needs some milk but it's right after this where he's found by peter and eddie is barely hanging on and it's like this is one of those moments that really reminds you of how far the two of these guys have come which i also feel like was one of the undertones from venom island which heavily referenced once upon a time when eddie had tried to kill peter but then towards the conclusion when eddie started telling the heroes about the coming of no you had a moment when eddie he directly addressed who he was then and who he is now because on top of that along the way the change in Eddie has also changed the dynamic between him and Peter and when Peter gets here recognizing that he wasn't there in time to catch Eddie it just breaks his heart and without knowing what to do from here he just cries out for help but in the case of Noel who had been standing there like this whole time watching from King and Black part 1 through Venom issue 31 all the way to this point in King and Black issue 2 <laughs> like he really wanted to see if Eddie was gonna stick that landing but really like when this happens Noel has a bit of a moment cause for a second he's like honestly how hard is it to kill one man and if you think about it this isn't the first time Noel has tried to kill Eddie especially if you count all the times throughout Venom volume 4 when Noel initially was doing the whole avatar symbiote thing so it's like now no has a bit of a moment like look i'm getting frustrated 
but then it's here where Peter's spider sense goes off and he ducks just in time to dodge an optic blast which grades us his back and it's here where Peter finds out that the heroes who were taken under that rather than them being killed that they were instead made a part of Null's army but with Peter being cornered here with Eddie like he's then saved by the arrival of Johnny Storm to whom in any other symbiote event like prior to no Johnny Storm would have been the end all be all because in any other situation he could have just flown around burning symbiotes left and right with fire being one of their long time weaknesses but later on we have found out that that was more so a byproduct of a disconnection from no which had started when he was initially placed in the symbiote prison but with him breaking out and reconnecting a number of them to his hive that weakness has been nerfed because now the symbiotes have a direct connection to the source but when Johnny gets here he pretty much tells Peter that he's going to use his Nova Blast to give Peter a chance to get Eddie to the Fantastic Four lab but even though Peter tells him and Johnny like he knows like after he uses his Nova Blast his energy is spent and after that the symbiotes will just get him too but he does this anyway in order to get Peter and Eddie out of there and in return he's like man just tell him I said something really heroic but with him doing this which is effectively like the impact of a small exploding star it effectively gave Peter the chance to get out of there and take Eddie over to the Fantastic Four lab but while Reed is doing what he can to help Eddie we also see Jane Foster Valkyrie here which is a role we'd seen her step into towards the conclusion of War of Realms but because of her role as a Valkyrie who are like your demigoddesses who would take your fallen warriors to the gates of Valhalla but aside from just as guardians there were times where they would tend to humans in wars as well but because of that role she can also see when someone's near to death and in the case of Eddie she more or less lets Peter know like she doesn't know necessarily how to save Eddie but she lets him know like she has a pretty good idea of how close to death Eddie is and man like if they were any closer right now they'd be kissing but then after this we jump over to Dylan who's inside the safe room playing on the PS4 and there's no harm in that I still got a PS4 Pro <laughs> no PS5 yet over here like I gave up that hunt a few weeks ago but I digress but either way because when we jump over to Dylan and Peter walks in here it's tough for Peter to even get the words out let alone look at Dylan out of guilt just because he couldn't prevent it what had happened to his father but even still like in this moment like props to Dylan for hanging in there tough even after what he had seen and even now in this moment being aware of the condition that his father's in but so when Peter and Dylan walk into the lab area with everyone else, like you got everybody else in the room and <laughs> all right, so you got you got Valkyrie, you got T'Challa, you got Sue Storm, Reed Richards, and there's no awkwardness there, which I promise is something I'll get back to in just a little bit. But on their end, T'Challa asks Jane like where's Thor, but as far as she's aware at this time, there's no sign of him. But then on the other hand, you have Blade who's on a virtual call with Xavier and Magneto, and he's trying to get them to open the gates of Krakoa so that the people who haven't been taken by a symbiote they can both go there for refuge and also deny no from taking more bodies but when this happens they refuse to give the world access to their gates and when they do this i really don't blame them because they've seen the consequences of acting loosely with letting just anyone onto their island let alone the mass numbers that blade is talking about and in their case with being in this last ditch effort for stopping the extinction of their kind they can't risk null or anyone else who pops in who will want to wipe them out and botch any of the plans that they have to secure their survival but then it's also here where peter asks like what's the update on Eddie like how's he making out is he getting any better but at this point Reed lets him know like there's no change in Eddie's condition but they're still working on it but on top of that like with still dealing with this huge invasion T'Challa chimes in letting them know that against Snow they have the full support of Wakanda and other forces but on top of that like hey can we get some of those infinity stones or the ultimate nullifier or the cosmic cube which Blade kind of feels like is a bit much for just one guy and Jane Foster's just like yeah we're definitely gonna use everything we got and she's absolutely right because this quote unquote one guy he's the same dude that tore the century in half just a few minutes ago and it really feels like in this moment that blade got a bit of short term memory because they also seen the celestials who Noel had also defeated and then later subjugated into a symbiote army and everybody here saw that like during the invasion you couldn't miss it and on top of that he's been this tough for billions of years and off of that alone like any suggestion for a cosmic sized solution it is merited in this situation but it's here also where Namor arrives and he hears like King of the Abyss and he's like yeah that's cute or that's adorable and it sounds exactly how Namor would make an entrance at this moment but also when he gets here like here's the thing I was talking about because when he arrives and Reed is kind of like side eye and Sue like did you call him to come here which is kind of a reference to the history between Namor and Sue Richards because she kind of does have a history of 
of stepping out on Mr. Fantastic. But I love that we see a bit of this because usually things like this are just brushed over or looked over when you have like these huge team ups with everybody. But it's like also the thing that's not mentioned here is like the history between Sue and T'Challa, which is one of those things to where like if you guys remember or for you guys that's been rocking with me for a minute, I did a video on that particular fling like a long time ago. And I got a link down in the description for anybody who's fairly new who would like to go check it out or for anybody who just wants to take a trip back down memory lane. But I like this moment because it, it reminds me of something my homeboy Rodney always says. Because he's like, if you keep enough skeletons in your closet, sooner or later a bone gonna fall out your mouth. And that really just describes Sue Richard's situation in this moment. But when Namor arrives, he really takes the room and he makes a few really valid points. And it really just crushes everybody's skepticism of him being here. Because Namor and his people, they've been fighting in the freezing dark for millions of years. These guys just started at it and they suck. And on top of that, if you want to talk about like whose world this is and who should be making any decisions, oceans and the water cover over 70% of the world. And with that being the case alone, if anybody should be here talking about what should be done to save the world, then it should be the king of the seas himself. And so after Namor is through with just validating the reasons why he should be here, he then asks if they have any suggestions or some type of a plan and immediately Tony steps up. He's like, I do. And it might sound crazy, but I need a dragon. <laughs> and I gotta tell you, I couldn't have been in the room because I would have been like, what kind of thing fam foolishness is this? But at the same time, this is Tony Stark. And if anyone is going to take every factor that is available and think their way through and around a number of solutions then it's going to be him and in this moment he puts together the need for eddie brock to be saved and the threat of no and he's like look i need one of the symbiote dragons because the symbiote's the only thing that's going to keep eddie alive and as far as finding a way to stop no tony then tells him that they need eddie alive because eddie's the only person that he's aware of who can get close enough to no to shut him down and with doing this, Tony has his methods on how he's gonna get the symbiote dragon, but then also he makes a suggestion for some of the others as well. To where in the case of Namor, he sends him down to the Marina Trench to release the Black Tide, who are cursed and imprisoned by the Atlanteans, and knowing that after getting their help, it's gonna be a whole nother thing trying to get them back within some type of containment or imprisonment. But even still, these guys are way tougher than anyone who Namor really has to ally with him, and that's exactly why they're needed right now, regardless of what they've done and why they've been locked away there. And as far as like how how to get them back in there after all this is said and done it's more like a we'll cross that bridge when we get to a type of situation or swim under that bridge you know whatever they say in the ocean these days but really that's the case everywhere else in the world because blade he's sent to recruit dracula and tony's also like somebody to get on the horn with mayor wilson fisk so he can pull together who he needs to because like we all know if there's anything that can bring the world together it's an alien invasion. But from here, jumping back over to Tony, who's taking care of step one, priority one, which is getting Eddie Brock a symbiote and getting him back in the fight. And when he does this, we get a bit more of the detail of Tony's plan of getting this dragon symbiote to where step one is breaking his connection with the hive. And to do this, he has to break down the dragon symbiote's DNA and rebuild it simultaneously. And because of that, he uses Extremis. And when I first seen this, I was thinking like, wow, that's perfect. But then I thought about it and just thinking about like how this worked out with the Hulk and the whole Doc Green situation, it then kind of made me think like, okay, there's, there's a number of ways that this could go wrong. But either way, Tony's able to pull it off and bring the symbiote back to the lab. But even with carrying it back, Tony's dealing with all kind of crazy sensory overload with the symbiote feeding him the screams of millions of people in pain. But he gets to the lab and he's like, oh, oh well, I'm still gonna give it to Eddie. And what do you know? The symbiote tries to kill Eddie. But when this happens, Eddie's vitals start spiking and immediately Reed just tries to rip the symbiote right back off. And for Dylan, he's trying to ask everyone to move and get back, but no one's really listening to him because he's a kid. And it just comes to the point where he's like, I said, move. And he does his Dr. Manhattan on a symbiote thing that he does. <laughs> But when this happens, like for a lot of them, this is their first time realizing what Dylan can do. And with seeing this, Reed then goes on this rant of how Dylan can be their secret weapon. And when Reed does this, I start thinking of a few alternate Reed Richards who would have reacted this way in this moment. Because when Reed talks about Dylan being their secret weapon, though it's a good plan, it also just feels like Reed is a bit too excited. I'm like, yes, yes, Dylan, you are incredible. You have powers. And I'm just looking in the corner of my eye like, all right, Reed, calm down. But then on top of this, they start to hear this noise kind of underlining through all the commotion, only to quickly discover that Eddie Brock has flatlined. And man, like really, like from this point, there's no telling like how this will affect Dylan because this could traumatically push him in any direction. But even still, I kind of got my fingers crossed that he'll remember the words of his mother from Venom Beyond or that Earth's version of his mother who had told him just before he left and came back here to remember her voice anytime he feels like he's being pulled into that darkness.
All right, so first thing I wanna mention, like before I would kind of blend what's going on with Venom, also with King and Black, which is something I'll do time to time when the main story or the main event just completely absorbs what's happening within a tie-in. But in this case, I wanna separate the two again so we can talk about Venom and what's going on with Eddie Brock, because in that case, I really wanna talk about in a separate video, like the afterlife that Donny Cates has established for people who die and enter into the void, whether or not they were bonded with a symbiote. Because I really wanna do a comparison of what we've seen with Eddie and also what we have seen with Cletus Cassidy, who had died minutes after childbirth, and with doing so, he was selected by No, which in that case was very much likely with him being a descendant of the serial killer, Cortland Cassidy. And so, needless to say, there's a lot that I wanna get to in a separate video. And aside from that, like from here, after we had seen Eddie die, both his and Dylan's story, they've kind of gone in their own directions for a little while. So for that reason, for the time being, I'm gonna try not to compress too much into one video because there's already so much happening in one issue and I am loving all of it. But when we jump in, we get this monologue with someone who's moving at the speed of light, heading towards earth and acknowledging like this path of darkness throughout space that Null has left in his wake, which about a month ago, we had got a glimpse of during Web of Venom Empire's End. And I really wish, by the way, that Empire's End was an event within itself. Like, if we had an event within itself that was the end of Empire, just focused on the end of that event, with Null just mowing through the universe, like, that would have been incredible. And I think a lot of people would have enjoyed that, rather than what we got, which was essentially Pike Nursery kills the Marvel Universe. But after seeing our light speed perspective from our mysterious traveler, we then go down to the ground level on Earth, where we see the heroes that are left doing what they can, with Sue Richards fighting back to back with Blade and also the vampires who had joined with Blade because the symbiotes have been taking all their food. But also at this time we see that Reed Richard has discovered a drive which he had gotten from Eddie which Eddie had then gotten from Rafe. And for those who don't know what this is I got a link below to where I did a video on Rafe and his entire history heading into King and Black because in the portion of that video when we got into Web of Venom Rafe it was then where we began to understand like the technology on this drive which was created by Rafe's father Sim Dell. It essentially was a blueprint for a power source that could light up an entire galaxy that was later then weaponized towards Null. And right now, Reed is staring at the symbol of the God of Light and he doesn't even know it. And there's a lot of potential of where this could go, especially with Reed and what he could do with this. But at this moment, he doesn't really understand because the information on the drive is still encrypted. But at this point with Reed rounding up the rest of the heroes on the comms and letting them know like the updated plan with escorting Dylan out, with them recently discovering that he can unbond others from symbiotes and otherwise possibly contribute substantially in what seems to be a hopeless situation. And right away, like, Reed lets Charles know, like, hey, if this doesn't work, Krakoa gonna have to step up. And Charles like, more or less, yeah, yeah, we'll keep the line open. But then also, like, in the case of Dylan, who's still mourning his father's death, Peter more or less lets him know, like, hey, kid, like, if you don't want to go out there, I will totally support you either way. Which is huge from Peter because he loves Dylan like he's his own. But at this point with Dylan, who's going through the phases of grief, he's like, nah, I need to hurt something. Like, he wants to get out there. And so when they get out there, they follow the plan by the book because you got Spider-Man, the Invisible Woman, Wolverine, they're staggering everyone who's in the way so Dylan can blast the symbiotes off of them. And one of the first things I'm thinking is like, man, this method is gonna take a long time to like cover the world. <laughs> like, I hope they got some children's Red Bull for this kid. But like, even with that being the case, like they're doing the best for what they have available. And at this point, with the survival of humanity being pinned against the wall, you just kind of got to do what you got to do. But also while they're out here, they run into your symbiote Captain America and he throws his shield at Dylan and Dylan straight up goes Winter Soldier on him and catches the shield. And when this happened, I immediately heard like the Winter Soldier theme music from Captain America Winter Soldier. <laughs> like that year, boom. Like I immediately heard that in my mind. But also I think it's kind of crazy because with somebody usually catches Cap's shield or they break Cap's shield. Like it's usually done as a symbol of the tides turning. And in most cases like fear itself, it's a symbol of the tides turning in a bad direction. Almost like seeing Superman's torn cape flying in the wind. Like it's a symbol of hopelessness. But with Dylan catching Cap's shield here, instead it's quite the opposite because it's a symbol of hope. And when he does, he speaks to Noah like we've seen before. And he tells him like, I know you're connected. Like he knows he can hear him. But also he tells him like, I hope you feel this and I hope it hurts. And when Dylan strikes the symbiote free and Cap, we see this light show up, which also also comes from the source of Dylan's power, but when this happens, it burns Noel. But then also as a consequence, this told Noel exactly where Dylan was, which got Dylan snatched up, but then immediately after, lightning just struck through Noel's hand, which was kind of puppeting the hand that physically grabbed Dylan, but on Noel's physical hand, like it left a hole straight through. And quickly we come to find out that this was Thor, who we knew because of the lightning, but nonetheless, Thor makes a great entrance anytime. 
and I think he kind of knows it too. <laughs> like he's Thor, god of entrances. Like Thor, all Thor needs at this point is like a DJ. Like when Thor steps in, just set out the horns like the bam, 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 bam. <laughs> because it's rare when Thor shows up and it's not like a moment. But immediately when he steps in and him and Dylan are like back to back, he then takes the stagger position, hitting everyone with lightning, while Dylan separates each of the hosts from their symbiotes. But even when this is happening, the Traveler's narration comes back and in a way kind of letting us know that Thor wasn't the person who we had seen rushing in at the speed of light. But on Earth, with no scene Dylan and Thor going back to back, he then drops in with a supervillain landing. And like the eerie slouch that Stegman gives him is like so sick. But when Noel drops down here to tend to this himself, he starts to get the speech of how he's the god of the void and king of the abyss. And Thor just kind of cuts him off like silent, which is more disrespectful than telling somebody to shut up, in my opinion. But with Thor going up against Noel here, it kind of plays out how I expected. Because even with as powerful as Thor is, being the new Allfather, he still more or less has a level of mortality. Versus Null on the other hand, who's a being of balance, which makes him not the kind of thing that you kill. And even though Thor mentions that he's ended many of gods like him who said that they're the end all be all. And I think on Thor's part, a bit of that is a bit of cockiness from the conclusion of Devourer King. And in that instance, it may be a fair comparison. But aside from that, like in the case of Null, there's a very short list of characters who are omnipotent, like truly omnipotent in a certain area. So like for Thor, whose power is built upon his father and his uncles, which is a lot of power, talking about realm separating power. But even with that, it's very hard to definitively gauge who can truly do the most damage here. But at a glance, with No being the pinnacle of darkness, which is everywhere and on everything that's three dimensional, which light is being casted on, but to oppose him, in my opinion, it would have to be the pinnacle of light. And honestly, that's not what Thor is. And I feel like even with this, a lot of people will be like, what? why didn't Thor do this? Why didn't Thor do that? Like, what about his warrior man? Madness. Why didn't he go berserker? And now that the Odin force is with the Thor force, like why didn't he do like Odin and unleash everything like when Odin separated heaven from the nine realms? And I feel like sure. Those arguments could be made, but even still a number of arguments could be made for No on how he could have escalated this here and now as well. But here they're just going blow for blow and No gets the best of Thor. And I appreciate that with the groundedness of this fight because at the end of the day this isn't Dragon Ball Super relax. But aside from this, like Dylan tries to help Thor, Noel pushes him away, which then allows Thor to kick Noel and create some space. And with doing this, he winds up Mjolnir and knocks the jaw clean out of Noel's mouth. And I'll tell you right now, like Thor is not the most skilled fighter in the Marvel Universe. He's not the most powerful being in the Marvel Universe. But if you ever had a short list of people who would give everything that they got in the fight and bring some serious damage while doing so, you have got to have Thor on that list because in the battlefield he is a complete savage. But when knocking out Null's jaw, Null then awakens the Celestials, which then gets Thor's attention, while Null then dons the Necro Sword. But while Thor is looking and Reed is trying to get whoever's attention he can to go and attend to the Celestials, and with Thor's back turned, Null grabs his shoulder and thrusts the Necro Sword through his back. And man, I tell you, this feels like a missing moment in another Donny Kate story, <laughs> but we'll talk more about that towards the end. But with Thor taken down, immediately Reed Richards is like, okay, we're done. Like we are losing big gun after big gun and I'm running out of holsters. But also with Thor going down, you know the whole island of Kokoa is looking at this like, <sighs> no good and well what Reed finna say next. But aside from this, you still have the celestial situation going on. And in that case, we find Tony, who has his extremist symbiote suit, which he's converted from the symbiote dragon like we've seen before. But with coming in, he tells Reed, like one, he's not just limited to making it a dragon. Like he can change the symbiote into anything he wants. But then also two, when he flies in with the symbiote, bonds it to one of the celestials, then making it what he would call his favorite new armor. But when this happens, we then see the ravens like show up over Thor and the narration from the traveler comes back. And when he does, he mentions the opposite of Null, who is the god of light, who is also the source of Dylan's power. But with Null effectively having the world covered, the god of light can't get through, but the Traveler, he can. And as it turns out, the Traveler is Silver Surfer Black. And man, I cannot think of another time when a cliffhanger has had my head spinning like this. Because on one hand, I'm like, man, is Silver Surfer going to use Thor's hammer? Is this going to tie into Thanos' wins? Like, what's going to happen with Thor? Because technically, he really can't die until he sees that vision where Thanos has Mjolnir and the Infinity Stones. So there's like too many things that can happen. And my head is just spinning thinking about all of it. And on top of that, like not to mention even like the full reveal of the God of Light and how that connects to the story of Wraith and the Silver Surfer because there is just so 
much history like coming back around here and for anyone who needs to get caught up before we jump back into part four i got links below for silver surfer black web of venom wraith and just talks on plenty of the build-up that donny cates has just been crushing lately heading into this event which feel like they're gonna pay off in a pretty huge way all right so in our last talk on king and black within the main event we focused on dylan and back in that video, I mentioned that I wanted to focus on Eddie a bit more because when we jump back into Venom, after Eddie's death, Venom Volume 4 then takes us into the life after death concept in relation to No, much like what we had seen back during Absolute Carnage. And I wanted to talk about that for a bit because when he falls and makes impact, like his consciousness just falls straight through and where he goes from here, like on this journey, it solidifies a number of things that we had seen before. Like in the beginning of Volume 4, when Noel had taken over the symbiote and in the way holding the symbiote hostage within the hive while pushing Eddie out. And then also in Venom Island, when the Carnage symbiote bonded with Eddie, taking over his body and putting Eddie in a prison within this same place. And when Eddie falls through here, he thinks of these instances and he recognizes recognizes that something about this place feels familiar and while Eddie's falling he hears a voice telling him not to let Noel's minions drag him to hell and this is the part that makes me want to jump back to the absolute carnage era and not even so much the absolute carnage event itself but more so the build up to it like we had seen in web of venom carnage born when we went over the different deaths and resurrections of Cletus Cassidy and how he had came back after Venomized, but also on top of that, Donny Cates had taken us back to when Cletus Cassidy had first died, which was minutes after his birth, 19 minutes and 38 seconds to be exact, back in the Ravencroft Institute for the Criminally Insane. But when this had happened, your young Cletus Cassidy, he had went to the void and when he came back, he had always remembered that experience. But it was here with your young Cletus Cassidy where the void was also referred to as hell and described as being an endless black abyss and even with seeing this like in the grand scope of like all the different hells in marvel comics like there's hella hells but in addition to that there's also a number of descriptions of the void as well and we've seen before where it's been referenced to as like a traveling point for some after death and recently well kind of recently the first thing that comes to mind is like back when we talked about as guardians of the galaxy to where back at the time loki had reforged his tool which could resurrect the remains of those who had died in every ragnarok ever as well as other mythical beings but but when this happened they came from the void as well and to my understanding like prior to carnage born with the void serving a number of purposes it had been used very loosely over the years to be like your travel way to different realms or even your space between splinter realms or pocket dimensions or birthplace of godlike characters like your chaos king for example but in relation to cletus cassidy and him coming here when he died at the time the younger cletus cassidy he describes that he entered this portion to where here he was caged but even still here he could see others in the afterlife but in his case your infant cletus cassidy he didn't go any further than this point but it's here where eddie falls through straight through his death into the void and it's here where he hears this voice saying that he's being dragged through to hell by Noel's little minions and it lets eddie know that he doesn't have to be just adrift and subject to Noel's quote-unquote minions but instead if he concentrates he could then stick the landing and more or less navigate his way through and it's here that we find that the voice that was guiding eddie was the voice of rex strickland who eddie had initially met during the beginning of venom volume 4 with at the time him helping eddie as a guide when Noel's avatar first arrived on earth and when eddie gets here rex he kind of takes on the same role with rex having died some time back and with that being the case he has a bit of a better understanding of where they are and how to navigate here and it's here where we learn along with eddie like what exactly this place is with him initially acting like he's back in the real world but then eventually realizing that he's not and really like as soon as eddie got there rex he initially like tried to tell him but for eddie it takes him phasing through some people and then having one of those dragons fly right through him until he finally slows down and he asks rex like what's going on and it's here where rex tells eddie that this place that they're in that this is the hive and that the two of them in addition to everyone else that they see that's like strung up and connected that each and every one of them are individual codex and to put it in a way that's a bit easier for eddie to understand rex just lets eddie know that they're more like memories or ghosts and at this point in time like within the hive eddie and rex can see that the other heroes they've been taken because as soon as someone's bonded with the symbiote within king and black their codex then appears here within the hive but for eddie he more or less knew most of these things that rex was telling him and mainly by the familiarity of where he had been from his time of death to this point but on top of this rex also gives eddie the explanation of why the two of them are able to move around unlike the others which in a nutshell is because they've been bonded to symbiotes longer and for that reason their codices are able to navigate through the hive a bit more freely 
But with Rex confirming that they are indeed within the network of Null's hive, Eddie tells Rex that they gotta beat this thing because Eddie and his symbiote, they've been freed from the hive before. And because of that, Eddie knows that there is a way that this can be done. And for Eddie, one of his first ideas is to get himself, his codex, back to his body and essentially pull off the same thing that had happened with Flash Thompson when Eddie absorbed Flash's codex back in Venom issue 8 when Eddie had first met the Maker. And even though back at the time, though this didn't last too long, with Flash's codex being burnt out by Eddie's symbiote, but even with that being the case, that doesn't mean that this wouldn't work for Eddie. But when Eddie tells this to Rex, like Rex, he's just killing all kind of hopes and dreams here. And it's kind of like one of those moments where somebody's like, I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but then they got some more bad news and all they have is bad news and not even a hint of a suggestion towards a solution. And that's exactly what Rex keeps doing here. And in this case, he gives Eddie the update that his body is flatlined. But when Eddie sees this and he sees his son Dylan crying over his body, Eddie then lashes out on Rex because he's not trying to hear that there's nothing they can do about this. Because for Eddie, the majority of his life has been him being pushed around because of the result of some other event. And he tells Rex here like he refuses to let his life end this way as well. And for Eddie, like it's here where he makes the point, like according to the rules which Rex had laid out to where the longer you've worn a symbiote, the more control you have over your codex. And Eddie lets Rex know that he's worn a symbiote like actively longer than anyone else else who's ever lived and it's a good point because it's almost like you know like if somebody gets a game on steam first and they play it for a little bit but then you get it like weeks later and you have thousands of hours in that game like your xp is going to be through the roof and in the case of eddie this plants the seed that he has the better chance than anyone else who's ever wore a symbiote to do more damage here in the hive if he can just get his hands back on the venom symbiote in this plan in theory it's super powerful because now you have the idea that if someone has worn a symbiote for a long period of time whether it's as long as Eddie has had the Venom symbiote or even something close that now they have a potential to be a threat to the hive and with this being a possibility at best you can nerf one of Noel's greatest strengths and bring him down to a playing field to where then Noel would have to fight without one of his greatest resources at his disposal and all of that is great but at this time Noel is still on the throne and Eddie doesn't even have a chance at attempting this without getting back his Venom symbiote so for Eddie it's not the most encouraging sight because there's a lot of hope in this plan but step one it's looking nearly impossible at this point but even with this being the case like Rex he sees the reason within this strategy and he lets Eddie know that he's gonna fight with them so he doesn't have to see this through alone but then on top of that Rex tells Eddie that he had actually found the Venom that he had been looking for in the first place and lo and behold it is Corporal Flash Thompson aka Agent Anti-Venom and man is it good to see Flash back and speaking of flashback pun intended like for those of you who are wondering like how agent venom got the white symbiote and even how flash thompson died i wanted to go back real quick and just kind of clear both of those up because back around like 2017 in venom inc alpha and for whatever reason it feels like it was much longer ago than that but back at the time when Eddie had got back the Venom symbiote, it was here where he was confronted by Flash who wanted the symbiote back. And at the time, the symbiote was kind of torn between the two of them and it had bonded to the both of them at the same time. And when this had happened at Alchemax, Peter had tried to save Eddie and Flash by killing the Venom symbiote by spilling a serum on the both of them, which was derived from the original anti-venom. But instead of killing the Venom symbiote and preventing Flash from getting it back again, Peter had then inadvertently created Agent Anti-Venom. And I gotta say like between the two, whether Flash was in black or flash and white i gotta say like the white symbiote suit looked way better but on top of this like when this happened flash had also got all the anti-venom abilities as far as being able to sense different toxins or even push those toxins or impurities out of the body of himself or even others but then on top of this as far as flash's death which i thought we talked about at one point but apparently we didn't and i think like at the time that i was going to do the video i had then went like on this deep curve talking about carnage and the history of the dark hold and how the swirly line symbols had showed up before donny kate was using them and because of that we never really got into like your red goblin story which will probably be a good thing to go back and visit now while there's so much going on in king and black because the story was pretty crazy but just to sum up a part of it after norman osborne had became the green goblin again he stole the carnage symbiote and peter had later called in flash for his help but around this time with Flash using his anti-venom abilities to heal Peter, to heal Silk and so many others, like it had taken a lot out of him. But also because of that, it had taken him a while to catch up with Peter. And when he did, he was in a much weakened state, which the Red Goblin took advantage of when Flash had stepped in and tried to take the Red Goblin down without being at 100%, which cost Flash his life, but at least gave Peter the opportunity to continue to go after the Red Goblin because of everything he contributed so far. And that's more or less like your two minute catch up on Flash Thompson. But Jumping back over to King in Black, like it's here where Flash arrives and Eddie starts to feel something crazy happening, but he's not sure exactly what it is. And we quickly find out that it's in connection to his son, Dylan. 
And once again, like just as a reminder, everything that we see happening here within Venom issue 32 and 33, they're playing out alongside what we had seen in King and Black. And in this moment specifically, it's around the time we had seen Peter give Dylan a speech letting Dylan know like regardless of what he chooses, whether to fight or take a step back and just mourn his dad, that Peter lets him know that he's fully got Peter's support because Peter didn't have that. And so like before we had seen how this played out in King and Black issue three. So it's like we know what Dylan's response is. But in this moment, like where it digs a bit deeper and we get like the full speech from Peter Parker. And he tells Dylan like when you lose someone you love and you wish the world would stop spinning, but it doesn't stop, it just keeps going. And I just feel like it was a great addition to get that from Peter Parker on this side of the story within the scope of the event where we get to hear more of the details of what Peter was telling Dylan and especially with Peter telling him like you, the feeling of wishing the world would stop spinning right after you lose someone because that's something that a number of us can relate to and for me personally it really hit home because I literally lost my mother a month ago and that feeling is one of the things that kind of cross your mind because with so many moving factors within life and within the world like these things don't stop just so you can catch your breath and I love that that is at least acknowledged here with Peter giving Dylan that option but then on top of that what i love even more is dylan's response like we had seen to where he decided to take it head on because had peter coddled dylan in this moment then i believe it would have hurt dylan more than helped him and even with saying this like don't take me wrong like in the case of handling grief it's not like a definitive thing to where the solution is go hurt something <laughs> not saying that but instead i like the concept or idea that dylan is going towards what's coming after him which was also his choice of how to process this and that's something that looks different for every individual but with this happening during that time in king and black where dylan starts freeing the different heroes eddie also senses this within the hive but before we jump back to eddie i wanted to say one more thing about peter real quick because in the case of Peter, and I'm not sure if this was like Donny Cates, his intention or anything, but this is just something that came to mind. Because in the case of Peter, like aside from him relating with Dylan with losing his uncle, or as Peter mentioned, losing his parents, you also then had the case to where Peter had made a similar promise like this, like the promise he made to Eddie to protect Dylan. Like Peter had made a promise just like this, and he failed before. Because back in Amazing Spider-Man issue 90, Peter was going up against Doc Ock and he had sabotaged his arms to cause him to go haywire, which at the time worked at taking down Doc Ock, but with doing so it was also at the high risk of civilian casualties. Because when Doc Ock's arms went on the fritz, Captain Stacy saved this little kid from getting crushed by nearby debris, which then landed on Captain Stacy after pushing the kid out of the way. And soon after, like with Captain Stacy's last words, and just to add in, like at this point, Captain Stacy, he knew that Spider-Man was Peter Parker. And on top of that, Captain Stacy, he was kind of like a, a next father figure and a close friend to Peter at this point. And just before Captain Stacy had passed, he had asked Peter to look after his daughter and I'm pretty sure that everybody knows how that played out. But this is one of the things that came to mind for me recently, just with seeing the changes in Peter's demeanor and also what seems like to be like the lack in confidence with him promising Eddie that he'll protect Dylan. But with Dylan freeing the other heroes, it isn't long before Eddie and the others, they see the other codices being released from the inside of the hive. But on top of that, like keep in mind, like when Dylan did this and he had like that moment where he told Noel, like I hope this hurts. And we had seen that Dylan's powers drew damage on Noel to some extent it's also here on the flip side to where in the hive Eddie Rex and Flash they find a rift as a result of it and at this time with Dylan and Thor fighting against Noel Eddie describes this rift or these cracks as like bruises in Noel's mind or the hive mind more specifically but with them being within Noel's hive at this moment it then begs the question like if they go through this rift like what is on the other side and when they pass through Eddie tells Rex and Flash that this is the central nervous system that connects all of the symbiotes in the universe and Eddie lets them know that this is the god hive and at first I was thinking like well how does Eddie know all this and we'll talk about how in just a minute but at first I did think Eddie was like I saw it first I get to name it <laughs> But with seeing this, it's pretty crazy because now we're taking like one step deeper, like behind the curtain and seeing like how Null's powers work, which with doing so also exposes some weaknesses because down below them, they see the symbiotes which have been separated from the hive as a result of Dylan and Thor going against Null. And because their connection has been severed, they've been caged up for the time being. And on top of that, like when Flash asks Eddie, like, how does he know all this? It's here where Eddie tells him that his other, the Venom symbiote, that has been reaching out to him and trying to help them along the way, which makes sense with it being connected to Noel and being able to feed Eddie all this information. But when this happens and Eddie fills them in, Rex says it's a suicide mission and like right after Flash is like, I'll go. 
and it's just kind of like man he good for those ain't he <clears throat> but when flash says this he makes the point that it was supposed to be him all along because he was the person who rex was originally looking for and i mean at the time eddie stepped up and did what he needed to do and now in this moment it's now flash's time to step up and do his part and initially eddie's against it and he tells flash that he shouldn't have to do this because he's a hero and eddie's not but flash shuts all of that down because everybody's got a pass and if you think about it even captain america because like didn't he lie on his military application <laughs> But that's aside from the point. And really like it's in this moment where Flash says something that's so profound. Because he tells Eddie like in spite of all that you've done, you're here now and you're storming the gates of hell trying to save the world and rescue your son. But the part of that that really gets me is where Flash is like, Eddie, you are a hero, but let me be a soldier. And when Flash said that, I was like, oh man, Flash, you giving Captain America a run for his money with these speeches. But after Flash says this and he jumps down, guns blazing, he then gets his hand bit off by one of the dragon symbiotes. But even when this happens, he's close enough to let off a grenade, freeing the imprisoned symbiotes, but also ticking Null off in the process. And when this happens, we see the freed symbiote go for Flash and Rex is just like, oh no, 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 they gonna kill him. <laughs> But Eddie's like nah cause he realizes the plan is working and right after we see Flash rise in his anti-venom dragon symbiote. And with seeing this I can't help but think like over a period of time like certain characters just deserve an upgrade. And Flash Thompson is definitely one of those people. And I can't wait to see like how crazy this gets for him moving forward like even beyond King and Black. But from here I'm guessing the plan is for them to ride on the dragon in like a never ending story type of fashion just with a anti-venom dragon in this case. But at the moment that plan is going to have to wait because as soon as this happened Noel shows up and he grabs Eddie. So in order for them to find a way out of here they got to get through Noel first. And because of what we had seen Flash do just now we know that Eddie's plan to get back his other it has a good chance of working. Alright, so jumping in we pick right up with Dylan right after Thor had went down in battle which had pretty much just left Dylan out there in the open. And as we come to find out, as a result, Noel takes Dylan and he brings him into this isolation that very much resembles like a physical hive just covered in symbiotes. And when this happens, like Noel tells Dylan that he brought him here just to talk and kind of like calm down kid, not gonna hurt you, I just wanna talk. Which is never a good sign when somebody you don't even know like that says something like that. But when this happens, like amongst this conversation, Noel tells Dylan that he is special, he is something new, and that they, air quotes, made Dylan to destroy him. So right off the bat, it's almost like we're hearing Noel share a bit of information about something he knows quite more about, but he's really not sharing the details. But in a nutshell, he acknowledges Dylan as his son, and he tells Dylan, like, if he joins Noel, then together they will end this war. But if Dylan refuses, then Noel would burn this world to the ground. But while Noel is here making this offer, there's another voice in Dylan's head that tells him like calm down, it's a friend. But this voice also urges him to realize that Noel is messed up with bringing him here. Because within this space, Dylan can use Noel as an antenna and push his powers through Noel and disrupt the hive freeing the others. And Dylan, he more or less shuns this voice off, letting them know like fall back, I got this. And he takes Noel's hand, which seemingly to Noel is like he's taking Noel's offer. But as soon as he takes Noel's hand, he tells Noel and you can tell he's really worked up when he says it but he tells no you killed dad and he grabs no with both hands pushing through to the hive freeing the other heroes but even still with dylan doing this like it's burning him too so while this is happening like he's struggling to hold on but even still like the voice that's in dylan's head is telling him to hold on just a little bit longer and also because with doing this they really only got one shot and with this one shot like who they get out they gotta make it count and with dylan freeing the others this voice is like okay look for this first part i'm gonna need lightning and i'm gonna need magic and when Doctor Strange is freed, the voice lets him know like, hey, I'm gonna download this plan into your head. It's gonna hurt a little. And as this plan loads into his mind, Felicia hands him his staff, which I believe was the staff from like Idrisil when Doctor Strange lost his powers, like during the Loki Sorcerer Supreme story. But at this point, Felicia had it. And around this time, she was trying to get it back to him. Like within the issues of Black Cat King and Black, <laughs> like say that five times fast, Black Cat King and Black. <laughs> but within her issues, Captain America had sent her off telling her she needed to use her talents whether to form a heist or whatever and steal Doctor Strange so they could get him back. Which by the way also got her a prototype anti-venom suit directly from Malcolm X. 
But with Doctor Strange getting his staff back, and then this voice loading this plan into his mind, not long after it then linked his mind with the others, and at this point you probably guessed who the voice is. Or maybe not, cause my first time reading this through like I thought it was somebody else. But we'll talk about who and I'll let you guys know who I thought it was like in just a minute. But with this voice linking everyone together, it uses Cyclops, Sue Storm and Doctor Strange to push and funnel the symbiotes into the center of the city. And with doing this it then calls for Namor telling him that now his turn is up as he brings the ocean water crashing in and when Namor does this it's kind of like one of those moments where it's like buddy you might have overdid it just a little bit like it really feels like he was too excited when his part of the plan came up and like he just turned up the water like all the way and Peter acknowledges this too and I mean part of the reason was because he was in the way but after this Storm and Thor then brought up to bring in the lightning and I gotta say like Thor you looking pretty good buddy I was worried about you and even still you might want to get your chest and your back checked out cause I swore you left a lung out there on the street like somebody grab a stethoscope and just double check this guy real quick but either way not nitpicking just saying Thor need to take it easy but for Thor and Storm, their part of the plan is just to send lightning like crazy through all the water and catch as many as the symbiotes both through the air and in the water. But then it's also here where we jump back to Dylan, who at this point is still close near Noel. And Noel just grabs Dylan by the throat like what were you thinking? Like did you think you were going to beat me? And he tells him like nobody's going to come and save him. And that's when the voice from Dylan's head then gets in Noel's head. And it's here where we get the reveal of whose voice we've been hearing from the beginning of issue 4. To whom as it turns out is Jean Grey. And I will say like initially I thought it was going to be Charles Xavier but with the fact of it being Jean I feel like it hits different because when she gets here and she gets into Noel's mind and she says let's see what makes you bleed I just can't imagine Charles delivering that line the way that Jean would but man like when she peeps into Noel's mind she goes on a journey through Venom volume 4 seeing him in the darkness his battle with the celestials his crusade from Jason Aaron's Thor which was reversed back and put into the continuity a retconned <laughs> I almost just retconned the word retconned just now but with looking in Jean sees all of this the forging of the necro sword and at this point she begins to think like there's nothing that can stop this guy and she believes that up until she sees the symbol of the god of light and it's here where she realizes that there's another an equal and opposite and man i'm telling you like it's this has gotten crazier than what i expected but with jean looking in she sees that there's an equal and opposite or even what is perceived to be a reaction to no because though he is from the abyss he's not definitively the darkness and much like how he rose up from the darkness this equal and opposite had risen from the light and with looking in and at this point taking it to like your Jason Aaron God of Thunder Jean sees that this light was also sentient and though at this time when No and the light had battled and the light was young and it was overwhelmed by the darkness it was then when the light had became something new and with doing so from there forward the light it would then bond with the being in order to make them powerful enough to fight against the dark and man when I tell you like <laughs> I'm kind of losing it here because it's here where Jean realizes that this equal and opposite that is actually also a symbiote but on this end a symbiote made of light because that's what it turned itself into in order to evolve against no but before Jean can tell Cyclops like the details of what she had found all she can really get out at this point is that the god of light is here but it can't get through and Jean can hear it screaming like trying to crash through the dome of symbiotes <laughs> the dome of symbiotes I just made that up but as far as like the covering of symbiotes that Noah has over the earth Jean can hear the god of light trying to get through and it's here where Jean then hears the voice of Silver Surfer Black who's like don't worry Jean I got this because even though the god of light can't get through the surfer can and the surfer takes the god of light into of himself and he makes his way through the barrier and when this happens like no immediately knows what's going on because the surfer comes through and he's just zipping through flying through dragons but he's not here to use the symbiote which in this case is the symbiote of light which has another name which may sound more familiar but we'll get to that shortly but the surfer he's not here to use it he's here to deliver it to his new host and when this happens Reed Richards he finally figures out the decryption of this alien message because with this surge of energy which has been brought by the surfer Reed he recognizes this energy signature like he's seen this signature before and when he moves the pieces that are on the symbol which is the symbol that we had seen in Web of Venom Wraith and when Reed moves the smaller circles around the sphere like it turns into the logo for Captain Universe and Reed is like I recognize this message like like this energy source is the enigma force and as soon as he solves it like boom the god of light comes crashing in and just like that Eddie Brock has been chosen to become Captain Universe. What? <laughs> what? <laughs> 
Eddie Brock is about to be Captain Universe because Captain Universe has been a symbiote of light this whole time. And I mean like starting now, of course, because it's a retcon, that's how they work. But nonetheless, it's insane and I love it. All right, so jumping back in from the two-in-one cliffhanger that we had got back in Venom issue 33 with Rex, Flash, and Eddie in the God Hive, it's here where we left off for one with Flash allowing himself to be bonded to one of the dragons at the God Hive, but his codex took over and he arose as the Flash Dragon. And I don't know if the Flash Dragon is something that's gonna stick as far as name-wise, who knows? But I like it, kinda got a ring to it. But also with this being the case, if you guys remember, we also left off with No taking over Rex's body and with doing so, snatching Eddie by the back of the neck and immediately no just lets him know like there's no way that Eddie could have thought that he could have just came to the god hive and no just wouldn't know because either way whether it's in the main hive or crawling through the breach and get into the god hive it still knows territory but with no putting Eddie in this very familiar predicament because I think no has a thing for just dropping Eddie like whether it's sneaking up on Eddie at high places or just taking him there and dropping him but even with this being the case Eddie tries to elbow himself free which was something that didn't really have a chance of doing anything with Eddie just being the Codex and Noel here in Avatar form even, but he does it still because to him, like, hey, it's at least worth a shot. It's like, what's the worst that could happen? Like, he'll drop you, but he was gonna do that anyway. So like, why not at least give it a shot? But even here, Noel reminds Eddie that he's not physically here, like at the God Hive, like Eddie is, or at least his Codex is at this moment, his memory. But it's here where Noel tells him, like, look, I'm up on Earth where your son is, and I'm about to rip the light out of that planet like a beating heart, and with saying that he he just drops Eddie again but when he drops Eddie to his certain death like his death within death but when he drops Eddie it's here that we see that a symbiote had made its way off of Noel onto Eddie which initially Eddie's struggling with on the way down but it's here that we find that the Venom symbiote has made its way back to Eddie after being taken by Noel to where during that time all it could really do is try to reach out to Dylan or try to guide Eddie throughout the hive in the God Hive because all the way up till now like with the few glimpses that we got whether it was in Kingdom Black issue 1 or 2 or in Venom issue 31 and really more so in Venom issue 31 because when Noel stripped the Venom symbiote from Eddie the symbiote it was literally begging no not to make him leave Eddie and even though at that time there was literally nothing the symbiote could do to like stop no from dropping Eddie but even still since then the Venom symbiote has kept true to his word telling Eddie that he's not gonna stop trying which is exactly what we saw when the symbiote was stripped away but also while he was being taken by no he was reaching out to Dylan who at the same time was looking for his dad and I mean technically they're both Dylan's parents both Eddie and the symbiote but even then the symbiote was looking out for Dylan while trying to help Eddie and it's been whispering to Eddie and guiding him ever since and now that they're finally back together like it just feels like finally <laughs> But man, we are just getting started. Because even at this point here, like keep in mind, we're still in the God Hive. So even at this point with the symbiote searching through Null and finding Eddie here, like once they're together, they're definitely Venom because the two together, that's who they are. But even still with them being reunited and Eddie swooping around going for Null, the symbiote then reminds him like this isn't the real fight. They still gotta get back to Earth. Like they gotta get back to the real world because if they fight Null here, he's just an avatar. It won't matter. Like he could just jump somewhere else. But then it's here where the symbiote tells Eddie like we got to go to the real world and it lets him know like it can take Eddie with him but with doing so all Eddie has to do is choose a form and when he does man does he because when they rise up in the real world it's here where they essentially have just symbiotes everywhere so it's like now with them needing a form like there's plenty of symbiote mass to build from and when the two of them come through like Eddie and the symbiote they just go straight Godzilla like King Kong versus Godzilla size and I'm telling you like man I would love to see this like a 350 foot tall like Venom just smashing through symbiote dragons like come on man like that would be nuts because he's like he's just swatting them out here but also with them making their way to the real world like Flash follows Eddie up but Flash and his dragon they're not like the Eddie Venom duo because Eddie and his symbiote have been bonded the longest so together they're mad OP in comparison to Flash but from here Flash is like hey point me out to this guy tell me where we need to go tell me what we got to do but Eddie's like nah this is between me and Noel because Eddie's got to protect his son Dylan but then it's here where Eddie tells Flash like hey you remember what happened to Cletus like back when he got that Grendel like during Carnage Born and Flash was like nah bro I was dead <laughs> 
<clears throat> but it's here where Flash tells Eddie like his physical form is still in the grave so there's only so much he can do. But with Eddie telling Flash the whole carnage Grendel hint more or less because in this moment like really Eddie doesn't have the time to spell it all out. But with him at least telling Flash that much he tells him to go and figure out the rest while Eddie goes on to take care of Noah. And by the way I got a link below if you need to check out my video on Carnage Born in case you missed it or you need to refresh your memory so at least that way you'll have a better idea of what Eddie was talking about. And come to think of it like that was a while back man I was like two years ago or at least I'm pretty sure it was two years because I remember when that video went live I was in Jamaica because <laughs> I specifically remember waiting to squat up with you guys as soon as that went live because it was nuts. But with Eddie and Flash going their separate ways, Eddie, he then goes straight for No. But just before he can reach No, he is then struck by a beam of light. And man, like when this happens, man, like you already know. <laughs> It's about to go down. But that's in King of Black, we're not there yet. And I mean as far as like the main issues versus the narrative here in Venom issue 34. But even though on the ground like all the other heroes that have been freed at this point, they're all just kind of looking up like what's going on. And really at this point, I just think the Silver Surfer, Gene, and Reed are the only ones who really know what's going on. And that's like with the exception of Noel, of course, like he knows what time it is. But with this beam of light hitting Eddie, this of course is the god of light drawing Eddie back to his body. And when it happens, initially Eddie doesn't want to let go of the symbiote, like he doesn't want to be separated again. But even still, his other tells him like, let go, let this light take you. Because eventually at some point, the symbiote will find its way back to Eddie, like he always does. But also like with Eddie being drawn back to his body or his codex being drawn back to his body, part of the process is him being torn apart with light and reassembling into a new form which is a form that he would choose but even still man i gotta say like it just looks painful but like it also makes sense like with the way that it's set up and like how we just now discovered that the enigma force that it's been a symbiote this whole time albeit a symbiote of light but nonetheless still a symbiote and the way that we see this brought over like by donny cates like it is nothing shy of genius because if you think of any time before just with captain universe and you have like that moment where the person is chosen and the enigma force either selects or rejects who it may like all this behavior the dialogue of the enigma force the sentience like it's literally literally had symbiote written all over it all this time and at this point it kind of makes you think like why didn't anybody else think of this because it just feels like it was supposed to happen but at this point with Eddie being drawn back to his body and the enigma force asking him like what form would you like to take but at this point Eddie he just can't help but laugh because really there's only one answer that Eddie's ever had to that question and that's an answer that he doesn't plan on changing anytime soon but we'll talk more about that once we get into King of Black issue 5 which is just nuts but even still we had to talk about Venom issue 34 first because for one we were kind of combining the conversations of the two but when the story of Dylan and Eddie split up then I was like hey okay we gotta split the playlist back up which now even makes more sense when we include everything that's going on with Flash to whom at this point like Flash he's pretty much figured it out because before when Eddie told him like hey what Cletus did you need to do and if you don't know what he did you need to go figure it out you need to do it and it's at this point where we see the Flash dragon fly over to Arlington National Cemetery and when he does he finds his grave and he crashes his Grendel or dragon on top of his grave seeping into the dirt and down to his body which essentially was the same process that we had seen with Cletus Cassidy from Carnage Born when the cult of Carnage took the corpse of Carnage and bonded it with Noel's Grendel but with Flash doing this successfully it now means that Flash is back and I feel like there's a pun there somewhere but I'm gonna let you guys take care of that in the comments but I will say like on top of this with Flash returning things are not gonna be the same because much like Carnage was different when he got that Grendel now Flash is different and I am here for it and I don't even know what the toys look like yet but man pre-order pre-order <laughs> like I need all of it because you just know it's gonna be sick Alright, so jumping back into King of Black, we pick up like not only right after issue 4, but also Venom issue 34, which both bring us to the point of the quickening of Eddie Brock. And I'm telling you guys, like it's taking everything in me not to make like a Highlander reference right here, because Eddie is charged right now. But while his codex is being drawn to his body by the Enigma Force, it also mentioned to him to choose a form, of which we didn't necessarily see in Venom issue 34, but that in itself we'll talk about really soon. But in the meantime... 
immediately when we jump in, we start with this standoff between the Silver Surfer and No. And immediately when we see this happen, like No kind of gives the Surfer like this I know you from somewhere type of energy, which is we know is from Silver Surfer Black when the Surfer got sucked into a black hole back when the Black Order stole the body of Thanos and both No and the Silver Surfer went head to head. But in response, like the Surfer, he lets No know, like indeed they have met, but even until now, the Surfer remains unimpressed. But I don't know about that man because back back at the time with Silver Surfer Black like I don't know like Norrin he seemed pretty impressed because Null and that Grendel was on him but let the Surfer tell it here like he's not impressed okay but while they're hearing this standoff the Surfer he then turns his board into a sword and when he does this he lets Null know like this isn't gonna be like before when the Surfer was like struggling to make stars and he tells Null like the reason why is because now there's another a god of light and with the Surfer saying that that's a pretty big point to be made there because even though when the Surfer faced Null the first time and the Surfer barely got away but even still at that time he was very much in a weak state which is different from now with him and his board fully charged up and when I say board it's a sword now but still even still it's fully charged up so not only does that in itself make a difference but also with him mentioning the god of light who Null had faced before and fought to a standstill like the two of those against Null like that really doesn't sound good for him with one of them fighting him off and of course I mean like with the help of ego but if Null has to face that the surfer who's now at full power and the god of light who fought him to a standstill then that's gonna be a problem but also no lets the surfer know like no matter how fast light is or no matter how fast light travels darkness is always there waiting and now that they're face to face again no tells the surfer that he's gonna die an honorable death and the surfer lets him know like well you might be right <laughs> but i'm not gonna face it alone and as soon as the surfer says this like cap calls avengers assemble and everybody comes rushing in like endgame but in this case avengers x-men fantastic four doctor strange blade heroes for hire and pretty much everyone that we'd seen out in the field up to this point but as soon as this happens there's a boom of light in between the heroes and no and it's captain universe venom on your front with the god of light in his chosen form being venom of course and it looks sick because the eyes and the venom logo are glowing but then you have like the star constellations throughout the rest of the suit which in a way gives it that captain universe design but in this case it leans way more towards looking more venom like but it's a sick combination like ryan stegman killed it but so now when venom gets here like Null tries to play him because he's like okay so the god of light then chose this dude that I done killed a bunch of times and because of that Null just sizes him up and he's like okay so like what what's gonna be different now oh man I'll tell you what's different because Eddie Brock the underdog Captain Universe he summons Mjolnir and the surfer's sword board and everybody is at a loss for words and like when this happened I gotta say like for Thor man like <laughs> these hammers ain't loyal <laughs> like Mjolnir belong to the streets but really like this ain't the first time and I'm sure it won't be the last so like Thor get over it because you and Mjolnir are in a open relationship in case you didn't know but then when Eddie taking Mjolnir and the surfer's sword <laughs> he then he then gets to mixing them up <laughs> and he makes a battle axe <laughs> And I'll tell you, like, what made it funny for me was, like, the look on Eddie's face before he exploded towards Noel. It's like he just looked at him and said, ooh, I got something for that And boom, battle axe. <laughs> and it looks so sick because you got, like, the handle of Mjolnir. But then the blade itself is very much like the Venom logo. And this thing is swinging the power cosmic, the Enigma Force, <laughs> and lightning, bro. <laughs> and when this happens, like, no, no wants no parts of this. But you know what, like it's also crazy because now Null is being chased very much like he was chasing the Silver Surfer. And you know what, like I don't blame him because Eddie went from zero to a million like real quick. But then also like the funny thing is like, okay, Cyclops is like, okay now, did I just see what I think I saw? Like Eddie Brock just made a battle axe out of the surface board in Thor's hammer and he flew. Like somebody please tell me I ain't getting my optic beams crossed out here like what's going on? But even with Eddie taking off like he tells Cyclops Cap and the others like to stay down on the ground and take care of the civilians. But while he's chasing Noel, Noel just throws a ton of dragons his way. But they just don't stand a chance against Captain Yuna Surfer Thor. And when it happens like no he plays it smart because he uses the pieces of all these dragons that's flying everywhere and he uses it as cover so he can sneak up on Eddie and strike him with all black. And when this happens man eddie then catches all black with one hand and then he turns all black into all gone like nothing left not a drop 
And of course, when this happens, Noah's just like, how? But even with seeing this, we gotta keep in mind what Rex said about Eddie being the longest to hold a symbiote and how that allows him to do things with a symbiote that no other host could do. And in a way, you can practically say that began when Eddie and the Venom symbiote separated themselves from the hive. But even with that being a factor and it being exclusive to Eddie, he then also has the power of Captain Universe. So it's like he's the perfect storm. Like this dude is broken right now. But with Eddie grounding Noel and winding up like he's about to go for the head, like I'm pretty sure he's gonna go for the head. But even with this being the case, Noel calls for his celestial that has been bonded with his symbiote to reach down, grab Eddie and get him out of there. And when it does, like Eddie immediately pulls a anything you can do, I can do better. Because much like Noel had decapitated the head of a Celestial and created nowhere, Eddie then takes his battle axe and he decapitates the Celestial. And it's crazy because Eddie is hitting these marks. Like he's doing, like he's pulling a Noel on Noel. And it's really one of those things to where, you know, Noel just had it coming, you know? Because in my humble opinion, it was very disrespectful when Noel came in out the gate with King and Black and pulled a sentry on the sentry. Because when we seen that, it kind of let us know that no, like he's he's another level of petty. But oh boy, when it comes to being petty, hey, Eddie got plenty. And he lets no Noel know, like he remembers. But wait a minute, like <laughs> it's funny though, like while they're fighting, how Spider-Man kind of gets in the way. But in a way, it kind of makes me want to read the Spider-Man King and Black tie-in again. Because those events might have been a bit closer to this than I've thought before. But who knows but like i was saying with eddie like he tells no that he remembers he remembers the pain that no caused for him dragging him up from the sewers the pain the fear the agony when he ripped away his other like eddie's being very intentional with all of this and now that the tables have turned eddie is now holding no by the neck and dangling his body off of a building <laughs> like man look how the tables have turned but on top of that he then digs into no's chest with his battle axe opening this dude up like this is personal <laughs> Like this is mad personal because when Eddie pulls the battle axe away in pulling the symbiote armor off of Noel, like he then tells Noel, like you want to know what I remember the most because he remembers feeling hopeless, feeling helpless. But the exclamation point, like he remembers falling. And when Eddie tells him this, he just drops Noel wearing nothing but his little symbiote loincloth. But even when Noel crashes down, like Eddie immediately comes after him. But as Noel gathers himself, he lets Eddie know like he can't win. And the reason that Noel tells him is like, well, Eddie may be able to kill Noel, like he may be able to kill him, but the darkness, it still lives in his son, Dylan. And man, did Noel mess up talking about Dylan? Goodness. Because when Eddie swoops in and he picks up Noel, I just knew immediately, okay, we going for a century style finisher. And when Eddie picks up Noel and takes him into space, Noel lets Eddie know that he'll never be free of him. And he tells Eddie like the darkness has teeth and Eddie's just like, well, so do we. And when Eddie says this, he opens his mouth and he just beams light to the equivalent of who knows how many stars on top of Noel's head as they make their way to the sun. And when this happens, I could just imagine like every previous Captain Universe looking at this guy like, oh my God, like why? Oh my God, what? <laughs> like Eddie chill. <laughs> But Eddie has zero chill because Noel threatened his son. And because Noel threatened his son, now that he has the God of Light, Eddie has to baptize this guy on the surface of the sun. And as soon as this happens, like Noel just turns into Pop Rocks. Like he's straight up just built like Alka-Seltzer in this moment. But effectively, it's here and now where Eddie Brock has defeated Noel. But even with doing so, like here's the kicker. Because as soon as Noel's defeated, Eddie starts hearing a countless number of voices and the Enigma Force tells him that it's the Hive and they're singing to Eddie because they're free. And as Eddie heads back to Earth, you can even see the Hive like leaving the planet as Eddie rushes his way back down to Earth. But what's funny is like back down on Earth, like all the vampires who were helping out and even some of those who were taken by symbiotes at one point, like they all just took the opportunity to just turn on Blade. But when the sky cracks and the multiple beams of light come down, like the vampires, they just didn't stand a chance. But then immediately after, when the battle axe comes crashing down, like the surfer calls for his board and Thor calls for Mjolnir and the axe comes apart. The board goes back to the surfer and Mjolnir goes back to Thor. And when this happens, they both kind of come to the conclusion like, okay, well, guess we want but the surfer then points out like even with this being the case things aren't gonna be quite the same from now on and it's kind of ridiculous like the way this pans out because in a way we also get to understand like what Noel was saying like seconds before his baptism because when Eddie gets back and Peter asks like is Noel finished and Eddie's kind of like yeah more or less but Eddie says more or less because he realizes a couple things are not quite done yet 
because for one, he senses something going on with Dylan, so he rushes through everyone to go and find him. And when he finds Dylan, Dylan tells him that something's burning inside of him because there's a piece of Noel that's still in him. And now that piece is burning him up. And Eddie tells him like he knows and he tries to calm Dylan down for a little bit. He's like, hey, brace yourself, kid. Like this is going to hurt. And when he tells him, he reaches inside and he grabs that piece of Noel and he pulls it out from Dylan and he destroys it because he made Dylan a promise that he wasn't going to let him fall to this darkness. And with pulling it out of him here, he honors that promise. And I got to say like, well, maybe it's just me, but with Indy's last few issues of both Venom, King in Black, and King in Black, like I kind of feel like Kate's and Stegman have kind of been giving us some of these like Matrix references, like with Neo pulling the bullet out of Trinity and Eddie essentially becoming the one like as soon as he turned to Captain Universe. But oh, speaking of which, like it's here where the Enigma Force then tells Eddie that he no longer needs the light to protect him. And as the Enigma Force leaves Eddie's body, it then tells him that he has become something else, something new. And like when the Enigma Force leaves, like all these different symbiotes, they start slithering towards Eddie and they start gathering around him and Peter and Dylan are kind of freaking out. They're like, what's going on? And it's here once again, like where Eddie hears all these different voices, it's the voices of the hive. But even with him hearing all of them, he can't tell what they're saying. And the Venom symbiote lets him know this because they're speaking in their ancient tongue. And the Venom symbiote lets Eddie know that all these other symbiotes are gathering around because Eddie defeated the void. He's freed their kind, and from here forward, Eddie is the hive mind, which also means that Eddie is now the god of the symbiotes, and on top of that, he is also the king in black. And now, my mind is officially blown. But then on top of that, like, what's even crazier, man, is like, Donny Cates and Ryan Stegman, like, Venom issue 200 is their last issue. And I mean, just as far as the two of them working together on Venom for the foreseeable future. But like, with this being the case, man, like, I'm not sure who's picking up later or after. But um, I just want to say, well, for one, I will. I will try it out. You know, I'm not going to say because they're not writing and illustrating that I'm not going to check it out. Like, that's just absurd. But I will say whoever's coming up after this, the bar is high like the bar it is up there it is up and it's stuck so whoever is picking up venom after this after this right here it better slap all right so we're jumping into venom issue 200 we go in hot off the heels from the conclusion of king and black when eddie defeated null literally becoming the king in black and becoming the symbiote hive mind as the new god of the symbiotes to where when we left off eddie had also freed the symbiotes which is something that still remains here and when we jump in eddie's going through like this whole montage in his mind of how much he's fought his entire life whether it was during his time as a villain versus spider-man or over the years against different heroes or in the past with his ex-wife and Wang, Dylan's mother, or symbiote dragons, or carnage, or his father, or himself, like literally his whole life. And I'm doing my best not to throw a five heartbeats reference right here, where the dude was like, I gotta fight every night to prove my love. Okay, I just did it. But for Eddie, it's crazy in a way because it's kind of scaled down for the sake of this issue, which is huge already. But on top of that, considering that he's died, he's been reborn, he was Captain Universe for a hot minute. But also with Eddie looking back on this, he thinks back on the moment where he defeated Null and he killed him, turning him into a sun seltzer. But he also expresses that with all of this, that he's known fear like never before, which is something I don't think should be brushed over lightly, especially in the conversation of someone who's a fighter, because oftentimes the fact that they've been afraid at some point during the process is often overlooked. But then in addition to this, Eddie thinks about how he's learned to love and how he's found peace, and that's all because of his son Dylan. But even now with Null defeated, Eddie's fight begins again. Because with Eddie defeating Null and gaining his power and becoming the hive mind itself, he's able to pilot symbiotes across the galaxy who allow him to do so, since he had freed them at the conclusion of King and Black. But with doing this, he's virtually omnipresent. And when we jump in with him here, we're like getting a peek into a part of what he's doing, which in this case is defending a peaceful alien race against a ravenous horde of conquerors. And with us getting just a glimpse into this, like it's sick because he's taking symbiotes from all over who at one point were just viewed as like just monsters or just dark or evil by nature, which when Noel came on the scene and started blacking out the universe, like that didn't help. But now with Eddie as the king in black, he's guiding the symbiotes as a force for good. And he's bringing that good to places like this unknown planet on the far side of the universe 
to a number of other places as well, like with him sending Symbius to Fallow to rebuild the Val Raven ancestral homes, which were destroyed by Noel while he was making his way to Earth, and in other places he has symbiotes literally holding the fabric of the cosmos together while rescuing lost travelers on another planet who are suffering in the cold. And Eddie even mentions, like we've heard in the past, of him being afraid of being alone, but with him literally being capable of being virtually everywhere at one time while also connected to a countless number of symbiotes who in some cases will even be bonded to other hosts and Eddie just will never be alone again because he is the hive, he is the plug. And with doing this, we also see Eddie use this method to attend a meeting in Asgard with Thor in the Parliament of Gods to where Thor thanks Eddie and shakes this avatar symbiote's hand for Eddie's contribution in the fight against No. But then it's after this where we see where Eddie is actually at, with his physical body on Earth, sitting in the spire which we saw returning King in Black, but in this case, he's moved it to his new apartment, which was a gift from Tony Stark. Which is a great gift, by the way, because Eddie's been couch hopping for a while now. So now he finally has a place that him and Dylan can call home. But for Eddie, being the hive of a billion different life forms, it takes a much greater toll on his physical body than what it did for Noel. And we see the cost of that when we find that Eddie has aged drastically as a cost of being connected to so many symbiotes for a number of hours at a time. But for Eddie, he feels like this is a price worth paying in exchange for the good that he can do. But even with seeing through a billion eyes and touching a trillion souls and fighting a countless number of wars, he expresses that this is nothing in comparison to raising a teenager which on one hand introduces us to the older Dylan, but it also gives us a taste of the symbiote co-parenting. But another thing that's changed with Eddie becoming the King in Black, he can't do the control or piloting thing with the Venom symbiote, or even track it for that matter. And because of that, the Venom symbiote is now technically the most powerful symbiote in the universe, as Eddie would describe. But also on this morning with Dylan getting ready for school, like he starts to tell Eddie that he'll be late coming home because of science class. But the Venom symbiote just jumps in like, detention, detention, no he got detention. And from there Dylan is like, you snitch. Because of course he didn't want his dad to know, but when Eddie asks Dylan like why didn't he just tell him, and Dylan lets him know that he tried to, but Eddie's just always been on his spire with his eyes rolled back. And because of that, Dylan just really hasn't had the chance to talk to Eddie or tell him what's going on at school. But then it's also here where we see Sleeper, who's telling Eddie that Spider-Man had called like 10 times, but I gotta say, like when I saw Sleeper here in this issue, it felt like that part in a sitcom where somebody walks in and the whole audience starts clapping, <laughs> and they gotta stop and wait till the audience stops clapping before they finish their lines, <laughs> like that's how I felt when I seen Sleeper here. Cause it's been a while and a lot of you guys have been asking about Sleeper and I don't think we've seen him since we talked about like Venom Island, so it's been a minute. But when Eddie asked Sleeper like, what, when did he call, why didn't you tell me? And Sleeper just tells him, I don't work here. And he just drops the phone, like, what I look like, Eddie? But with all this happening, like, Dylan, he gets to squeeze his way out and make his way to school and kind of dodge the lecture from Eddie because if he doesn't leave now, he's going to be late and then he's going to be in more trouble. So for the time being, Eddie, he just got to give him a pass. But with Dylan and the Venom symbiote leaving and the symbiote being in like a guard dog form, like we saw him do for Eddie in Absolute Carnage, but on their way, Dylan asked the Venom symbiote, like, what do I call you? And like, as far as names go, and it kind of throws the Venom symbiote off because it's never really had a, a name, not like Sleeper or phage or riot or any of the other symbiotes who actually have names exclusive to themselves rather than like a title name that they share with a host but it's here where the venom symbiote expresses to dylan that its name is communicated through a host through an emotional vibration and because of that there's not like a translation to its name which could be translated with human vocal cords but while they're walking dylan tells it that he can hear it like he can hear the emotional pattern and when the venom symbiote tells dylan to hold on tighter the pattern gets stronger and it literally brings tears to Dylan's eyes and Dylan was just like thank you for that like he needed that and I wish we could hear it too but it doesn't quite work that way but after this we then jump over to Eddie who's catching up with Spider-Man after missing 11 of his calls because he called again when Dylan was leaving but when they meet up here to grab a bite to where this restaurant looks like the same place from Absolute Carnage but when they meet up here and Peter apologizes for being in costume he then begins to explain to Eddie that he had to stop a robbery but Eddie finishes Peter's sentence because he already knows and it throws Peter for a little bit but then he's like oh yeah okay you got the omnipotent god thing going on but Eddie then clarifies it, letting Peter know that it's more like omnipresent, although not exactly because a symbiote has to be there. But with symbiotes all 
over the place is pretty close, like it's close to omnipresent, rather than being omnipotent which means you already know everything. But then also with Peter asking Eddie how's he doing, Eddie lets him know that he's doing good and they have a little back and forth on whether Eddie's doing good or doing well, which in the case of Eddie, he's literally doing both. But then when it comes back around to Peter, he expresses that he's dealing with a great deal of guilt because of Null and the invasion and all of the planets that suffered as a result, as well as Dylan getting caught up in the middle of all of it because Peter feels like it's all his fault after bringing the symbiote back after the first Secret Wars. And this is something we saw recently weigh heavy on Peter throughout King and Black, which for the most part was by way of the tie-in, but nonetheless it weighed heavy on him. But then it's here where Eddie lets him know that symbiotes have been on the earth for thousands of years. They fought in Vietnam, they're part of the Weapons Plus program, they're part of the Legends of Beowulf. And when Peter hears this, like he puts the mask back over his face and he might have mouthed a few choice words at Eddie for not telling him sooner. And it's not really like Eddie knew forever ago. Like he really just found out when Null had just shown up and the Grendel arrived. So close to a year and a half, two years maybe. So when Peter's like, he never told me, Eddie's like, uh, I just did. But in the middle of their conversation, Eddie, he then goes back into God mode to where he starts doing his omnipresent thing, which Peter says is kind of rude and he's not wrong. But while he's doing this, Peter then reaches over on Eddie plate to try to take a fry which is something that only a menace would do but omnipresent Eddie just slaps Peter's hand away because even in God mode he's not letting that slide but not long after doing this Eddie comes back and he tells Peter like we're about to get robbed but with this happening which also happened in absolute carnage issue one because I knew this place looked familiar and I mean I'm not 100% sure it's the same spot but I do recall Eddie and Peter getting robbed together recently or fairly recently in a similar looking space with the brick walls and a television that was like catacorner to where at that time Peter took down the crooks but this time around Eddie's like I got this and he takes down the guy with the symbiote cane and he lets Peter know don't worry I've already alerted the police so we're good. But then also with doing this, he asked Peter to pay the tab, which is, this, this is where it starts to get weird, as if it hasn't been already. But when he asks him to get the tab, and Peter's like, I don't have pockets, they then go outside, and Eddie's like, I should've told you. And Peter's like, what? That you're actually an alien life form being controlled? But then Eddie corrects him, letting him know that the symbiotes, like, they let him pilot them from different locations all over the place. And also here, Spider-Man tells Eddie that he doesn't know exactly how he could help Eddie, but whatever he can do he's willing to do and Eddie stops him and he lets him know like okay well I'm not sure exactly how and that he may need help in the future which will most likely be different than what it was in the past but Eddie lets him know that he's good with Spider-Man just being a friend but then after this when Eddie tells Peter that he has to go because Dylan's gonna be out of school soon and right then Eddie starts to come apart from like the legs up which throws off Peter like what's happening and right after that Eddie just takes off within a swirling fleet of symbiotes as if Eddie was never physically there at all and it leaves Peter speechless for a moment but after a little bit he's like okay that that was pretty cool but then it's also here where we see Eddie do the multiple locations thing once again in different parts of the world both with the Avengers and in Krakoa while also reaching out across the galaxy and meeting with the Guardians as well but also while he's having this omnipresent meeting he's also expressing the potential of these abilities with him thinking back on Venom Beyond, Venom Island, or even Lethal Protector where his consciousness can lead between moments in history and also beyond dimensions which then show us a glimpse of his childhood and what appears to be even the first Secret Wars. And it's crazy seeing this because we'd also seen this idea explored within King and Black symbiote Spider-Man to where after Noel was released in the present which was King and Black at the time but with doing so he was also able to reach back in time to Mr. E and change events in the past which back when he was here like that was possibly Noel's most powerful gift but even now with Eddie having Noel's powers and Eddie being able to look across the galaxy there is only one being that has escaped his sight and his reach and that is the maker who like we had seen towards the beginning of Venom Beyond the maker had back then brought in the Venom symbiote from the 1610 and with doing so he had used Eddie and the 616 symbiote along with the maker using some of his own technology to repair and enhance that symbiote just before the maker had went to the Ultimates universe at the beginning of Venom Beyond and we find that Eddie's having this meeting with the Avengers, the Krakoan Council, the Silver Surfer and the Guardians of the Galaxy and he informs them that the maker has been in contact with the Council of Reeds who have issued the maker with the challenge of restoring the Ultimates universe and with doing Doing so he would earn his way amongst the Council of Reeds and with the way that Eddie describes this to everyone it's almost as if the maker is planning some sort of invasion to bring in all the people or the characters from the Ultimates universe and over to the main Marvel universe rather than some type of incursion or time running out 
again but with however it's being done i'm here for it because when this channel first started we were talking nothing but ultimate universe and hopefully and i know it's kind of a long shot but hopefully when this happens we get some more james hudson jr because even though he's been in the main universe for some time he has been mia since like venomized and because of that he's likely somewhere around the place with the symbiote but who knows but also at this point with us seeing the return of the ultimates universe within spider-man 2 to where aside from that we only got like a glimpse in venom beyond but with us knowing that it's been back prior to this we now have the additional information that has failed according to the council of reeds and with this happening it's setting up for the maker to attempt to take the main universe in place of his own by way of invasion and this is why Eddie's reached out to everyone because he knows he can't just stop this on his own. But then we also get a moment to where Eddie kind of blanks out and when Tony gets up and gets in his face like, hello, you still there? And it's here where Eddie tells Tony elsewhere, Spider-Man's trying to steal his french fries, which is just kind of crazy just thinking of the omnipresent thing that Eddie's just doing everywhere. But then it's also here where Captain America re-extends his offer to Eddie to join the Avengers, which initially happened in either War of the Realms or Venom Island. But this whole meeting up and telling the heroes thing, like in the first place it reminds me a lot of Venom Island when Eddie grouped up all the Avengers at the time to tell them that Noah was close to Earth but with Cap re-extending this offer Eddie lets him know that he's good that he's more the stay at home dad but he knows a guy who could dedicate his time to this a guy who has the skills and the know-how to track and to infiltrate and someone who knows how to work with the team and that of course would be Flash Thompson which is a really good look for Flash but right after this where we jump over to Flash we kind of see his adjustment of getting back into the world and at this time the world is divided on the idea of symbiotes given the circumstances of the recent King and Black invasion and how crazy that went and then on top of that Flash is also in this weird space to where the people who know him and love him just buried him so even though he's back in the city he's still been trying to lay low because he's not trying to pop up on the people who just buried him and give his mom a heart attack but while he's here and he's just ordering his drink and also just making casual conversation with the young lady who's just waiting on her drink but while he's doing this blam the dude behind the counter just gets blasted and when this happens he pushes the girl down to keep her safe but when he turns around he sees that this was done by a group of guardsmen and man with seeing this like you know what this means or at least i hope it means what i think it means because the last time we had seen the guardsmen which come to think of it i think it was the first time we ever seen the guardsmen but this was back in planet of the symbiotes issue 3 where we got the return of the toxin symbiote and his new host which hopefully means that we get a toxin flash thompson agent anti-venom team up at some point in the future like just hoping like i really hope we do but just as a reminder like the guardsmen who are quote unquote built to beat symbiotes but these are like your soldiers slash alchemax security officers who are here on the hunt for a symbiote and when flash sees them they're confirming their target is down and when flash hears this he's like what are you guys crazy you just killed an innocent kid and when one of these guys tells flash to stay out of it flash suits up and he beats the brakes off of this guy which by the way just shows us off the bat like a comparison between how powerful flash is now after his carnage like grendel resurrection versus how powerful the toxin symbiote is because flash runs through two of these guardians way quicker and way more efficient than what we saw with toxin when he was just dealing with one and granted toxin has a new host and he's getting back on his feet but with us seeing how flash has handled these guys it just lets us know off the bat that alchemax is not ready for the new agent anti-venom but then after taking down two of these guardians, the last one grabs the kid who as it turns out, he's a symbiote to where in his case between him and his other, he had a terminal illness to where without his other, he'll be dead in a month. And with hearing this, the guardian's like, oh, a month? Like he's gonna die without the symbiote anyway. And with hearing that, he then tries to kill him again. But before he can, Flash just catches him with a one hitter quitter, saving this kid and allowing him to get away. But this is also one of the things that shows us that once Eddie had became the King in Black and he freed all the symbiotes, like a number of them had just been going around just living their lives which on one hand is a bit of a benefit because it does give eddie additional eyes everywhere but in the case of flash like when he discovers this he more so sees the side of where people are still afraid of symbiotes because of everything that had happened within the king and black event but then after this we then go over to dylan and we see like the whole situation with what's going on with him at school 
to where for the record he goes to Midtown High School, which was the same high school that Peter, Liz Allen, and Flash Thompson like they all went to together. But here's the thing, because when we jump over to Dylan, right away we find out that he's being bullied by a senior named Kenny McFarlane Jr., which of course is one of your easter eggs to Todd McFarlane, who visually blessed with his art style a number of characters, Spider-Man, Venom, Batman, obviously Spawn, and a number of others, the list goes on. But when we jump in with Dylan here who's being bullied by this professional senior, which is what we call a senior who's been a senior more than once, but then the next thing we see is bang, Dylan hits him with the headbutt, then boom, punch to the ribs, and after that Kenny pushes him into a locker, but then we see Dylan kick this kid in the face and tackle him through a window. And when I first seen this, I was like, man, I thought my high school was bad. But when we see this happen in Dylan who's just laying into this kid and even to the point where he grabs a piece of the shattered glass like he's about to finish this kid off but then it's here where we see that during this whole time that Dylan has just imagined where this fight could have gone because instead of fighting this kid Dylan he just turns the other cheek which then leads to Dylan getting beat up instead and as a result he's then sent to the principal's office and this incident it shines light on the reoccurring issues that Dylan had been having at school and why he had gotten detention before which is something I never understood back in school like why is it the kid that gets picked on he gets punished too but then again in my later years of high school I went to Oakwood and whenever we had a fight at school the teacher just called the police <laughs> but with saying that I can already see the comments now like <laughs> like y'all gonna be like don't spill went to lean on me high school <laughs> but it's all good leave all your Morgan Freeman jokes in the comments but with Dylan being in the principal's office here he initially goes off like he didn't start it but the principal then tells him like he's more concerned about Dylan being angry all the time and so when he asks Dylan like how are things at home and Dylan just brushes it off like everything's fine to where he then asks Dylan like well if everything's fine then why can't you stay out of trouble and why can't you stop fighting to where Dylan then answers because he's been fighting his whole life and right there is like we get a moment of the son becoming the father with how the issue opened with Eddie looking back on his whole life and with looking back the thing that stood out to Eddie is how hard he had been fighting the whole time and with seeing this it feels like a bit of foreshadowing for Dylan with us briefly going through a number of Eddie's conflicts and us seeing where that's brought him to to this day and with that being the case I can only imagine that there's a number of stages left ahead for Dylan just by holding the evolution of his father in comparison but as Dylan is heading home with the Venom symbiote, he hears a noise in the alley, and when he goes to check it out, come to find out it's Jack-O-Lantern, who's popped up quite a few times throughout Venom Volume 4 by the way, and I'm not really sure why. But when we see him here and Dylan gets his attention, Jack-O-Lantern's like mugging some lady in the alley, but then when Dylan steps in, it gives this lady the opportunity to hit Jack-O-Lantern and make a run for it. But then when Jack-O-Lantern pulls the gun, that's when the Venom symbiote then steps forward, and with doing so looking just like the nah he don't bite me and like when I first read this like that's all I could think of and then when I turned the page I was like oh god yeah like that's how people's dogs be looking and they be like oh Cerberus just wants to play but when this happens like the Venom symbiote is just trying to protect Dylan because since Eddie's become the king in black that's really just become the symbiote's full-time job but when he goes for jack-o-lantern he scares him and jack-o-lantern then shoots through the symbiote hitting Dylan right in the chest and as soon as this happens, Jack Lantern, like, he knows right away that he messed up. But then on top of that, when the Venom symbiote starts to grab Dylan and wrap around him, forming these chains, and it's right then when Jack Lantern then notices that, oh snap, this is Eddie's son. And it's right there where the symbiote then bonds with Dylan, healing him. And it's there where they then tell Jack o' Lantern, like, hey, no, you don't know us, but you will. They all will. Allow me to introduce ourselves. We are Venom. And he just smashes this dude. You can hear him screaming from down the street. But then after this, when Dylan and the symbiote make their way back to Eddie, and when they get back, they're later than what Dylan had expressed that they would have been earlier. But when they get there, Eddie's like, well, that didn't take long. And not even in relation to the time that they're getting there, but to the fact that Dylan is arriving in the Venom symbiote. Like, where? the symbiote and when they get there Dylan's making his way out the symbiote and he's trying to apologize for being late and explain on how there was like this woman in the alley who needed help but even with this happening I gotta say like it's pretty badass like the way the symbiote made like these stairs so Dylan could walk down which might even move like an escalator who knows 
But when Dylan gets there, Eddie stops him in the middle of what he's saying and he tells Dylan that it's okay. Because Eddie knew at some point in time that it was going to come to this and all he's ever wanted for Dylan is for him to be safe and to be happy. And Eddie knows as far as the happiness part like that's going to take some time, but in the case of Dylan being safe, Eddie tells Dylan that he knows that there's no safer place in the galaxy for Dylan other than Dylan being with the Venom symbiote. And when this happens, it's like a passing of the torch so to speak, with Eddie retiring and being the quote unquote stay at home dad. But from this point forward, Dylan is now officially Venom. And with seeing this, you have like this moment to where Eddie tells Dylan like to step back in so we can get a better look at him. And Eddie's like, well, you're kind of big. And Dylan's like, well, I want it to be scary. But also with Dylan, he's chosen to use chains instead of webs, which I feel like is an additional homage to Todd McFarlane. But from here moving forward, once again, I gotta express, I'm a little nervous. Cause I don't know who's taking over Venom from here or where the new Venom's gonna go in the future or what's even gonna happen with Sleeper from this point. But that's just one of the things we'll have to wait and see over the course of time. And so now real quick, I wanna give a special shout out to all the patrons. Thank you guys for all of your support. And for anyone who's new here, who wants more information on how to support the channel, I got a link below so we can go to patreon.com slash dope spill. But that'll do it for this one guys. Let me know your thoughts down in the comments below or over on Discord and we'll do it again on the next one. All right, later.